Mm -hmm. I'm Junior Francis. Welcome to the History of LA's Kia one-on-one -on -one sessions. This series celebrates Southern California's ska, rock steady, and vintage reggae scene through insightful conversations with the legends and modern day players, including those behind the scenes, and believe me, they are numerous. This is a 19 one-on-one -on -one session on our fourth in this exciting new podcast, YouTube channel format. Thanks to our regular listeners and supporters, and thanks to first timers, and thanks to returning listeners. Today's guest is musician, journalist, podcaster, ska enthusiast, and author of the book, In Defense of Ska, Aaron Carnes, who is coming to us from Sacramento, our sister city of Sacramento, California. This is his new book. Hey, Aaron, how are you, sir? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm fine indeed. I'm fine indeed. We've been talking about your book, among other things. Welcome. Right. And first, uh, first off, congratulations on the release of your new book, In Defense of Scare. I you. can imagine it was quite an undertaking, perhaps an undertaking of titanic proportion, but you know best. So let's start from there. <laughs> what sort yeah. of undertaking was it? Uh, a seven-year process to mm. write that book, yeah. Right. Ah, it took Michelangelo, so, I think, just as long to paint the Sestine Chapel on his back <laughs> by himself. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk uh, about your work as a journalist. Sure. Maybe that's a good starting point that we can get into the book, among other things. Sure. Uh, I started, uh, I became a journalist in 2009. I was... Um, Actually, I had been a writer. I'd write wrote fiction and stuff for a while, but I thought maybe um, I would try my hand at writing nonfiction. And so I, I volunteered. I was living in San Jose, California at the time. Mm -hmm. So I started to volunteer at uh, like local community newspapers just to sort of, I don't know, have, have, have some, something on my resume and to just understand how it is that you write for newspapers I did this in like 2009 and I would do like, um, it was like um, like neighborhoods. So it was like in San Jose, there's like different neighborhoods, like Willow Glen's like a neighborhood and Campbell's like a nearby city. So the, these these <coughs> cities, these cities and neighborhoods had their own little mini newspapers. And I would go to like city council meetings or I would do things like cover like an Easter egg hunt for kids and stuff. It was real basic stuff, but it kind of gave me a crash course and how this is done. Mm -hmm. And then once I got to um, maybe six months of doing it, I felt a little more confident as a, as a writer of newspapers. And I, I, I went, I called up the local alt weekly, which in San Jose, that's Metro newspaper. And I said, Hey, I want to write for you guys. And they said that they would let me intern for them. And so I did that for another six months before I became an official like freelance writer for them. And then from then, and by the way, I interned as like a 30, 33 year old so it was kind of and I was not in college so <laughs> but that's fine you know you kind of, you have to learn how to do something you have to oh, kind yes. of get, you know mm -hmm. so I, I, I was getting an education so so but you know I, I started to write articles and then I started to freelance for other publications as well over the next few years I was doing um, eventually I, I was able to write for Playboy magazine I was writing for Salon Sierra Club, Sun Magazine, um, Van Camp Daily, that's the blog on Van Camp. Um, these days I am the music editor at Good Times, which is a alt weekly in Santa Cruz, California. Mm -hmm. And um, do, I do some freelancing. I haven't been freelancing as much um, because of the book. In 2018, I got really heavy into writing the book. Before that, it was kind of a, you know, from like 2013 to 2018, like mid 2018, mm -hmm. I was working on the book, but I was not full-time working on the book. I just kind of, as I had time, I was working on it. 2018, I got contracts signed. And so kind of the second half of 2018 till about early 2020, like writing the book took over my life. And so I wasn't able to freelance as much. And then I've been promoting the book. So that took up so much time I still haven't been able to freelance that much so now I'm kind of kind of just getting to that pl place now where I'm thinking about freelancing more you know back to what I was doing mm -hmm. right by freelancing that's how you pay the bills I suppose 
I pay the bills, you know, I also, I've been, I've been the music editor at Santa Cruz we, uh, good times. So that helps. That's mm -hmm. sort of like a, that's, that's a pretty steady gig, but mm -hmm. freelancing helps, you know, right. Supplement so that I'm not, you know, living hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. Right. That's good. You're also a uh, muse, muse, uh, music writer music is oh, is that what your the, the title is music writer yeah i mean i primarily a musician work, writer right i mean write about music yeah i would say i do write about different things but like probably 80 percent of my work as a journalist and a freelance writer is music oriented mm -hmm. kind of feel like music's my strong suit whether it's not this doesn't have to be ska it's like you know other styles of music too uh, i occasionally write about food or you know art or you know occasionally some news stuff but I, I tend to i tend to stay in within the realm of music i just feel like i have I'm, i know what i'm talking about <laughs> when it comes to music and right not as much with the other stuff you know mm -hmm. so why do you feel a need to defend Ska and even write an entire book that took you oh, actually yeah. seven years that's the perhaps that's the, the most, question. most important question of the night i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the purpose of the book is to <clears throat> defend Ska is a little bit of a fun way to say that the real purpose is to sort of like, um, I feel like Ska's history, particularly after Two-Tone, has been largely misunderstood by the community outside of the Ska scene. And it's been kind of dismissed and written off by a larger culture. And I just felt like it would be great for people to have a better understanding of the journey that Scott has taken since, you know, people, most, some people understand that it's uh, Jamaican music originally. Uh, I, I, some people, uh, although not everyone knows that it predated reggae. And then I would say a decent amount of people know that it kind of got revived in England in the late seventies, but people, <laughs> They know about 90s ska. They know ska got really popular in the 90s in the US, but they don't really understand what happened between Two Tone and 90s ska. They don't really know the other kinds of bands that were happening that were not on the radio, and they don't know what's happened since. So they've really minimized the story of ska to a way that I feel like is, you know, they're missing out. They're missing out if they, you know, they should learn more about this genre because it's been a very healthy, vibrant genre for the past you know, mm -hmm. since the 50s, since it started. And and since the late 70s, when Two-Tone revived it, it's been a real consistent part of the global landscape of music. And I don't I don't see why people just want to like make jokes about it and pretend like it was this trend in the 90s. There's, there's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. And what do people who are inclined to make fun of it as a, uh, perhaps radio people in radio industry, uh, I don't think fans necessarily would, right? So perhaps those who have their those who have their hands are the levers of power. Yes, I'd say that there's like uh, <clears throat> music critics do not take ska seriously for the most part. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of people that grew up in the '90s and maybe had some familiarity familiarly familiarity with it, and mm -hmm. so <clears throat> they don't understand anything more than that sort of mm -hmm. mainstream moment. That's all they really understand about it. So mm -hmm. they think back to this this weird period of time in the 90s where all of a sudden kids were wearing uh, you know, fedoras and they were dancing and that's all they know. They're like, wow, what a weird time. And there's all these dorky kids, but that's really not, that's a really small piece of mm -hmm. Scott culture in the last like 30 years. Right. To validate your point, I remember once I auditioned for a job on a commercial radio station and uh, the guy who interviewed me said that, no scare. He didn't no, mind Scott. rock steady. <laughs> he said it. <laughs> and he has major ties with Jamaica. <laughs> wow. He said, no, Scare. Yeah. He didn't think people would like Scare, but uh, rock steady and the other stuff. Because he associates me with playing a lot of uh, classic stuff. But he yeah. specifically said, no, Scare. And I, I was I, uh, taken aback. But, um, you know, I didn't expect him to say straight out, no, Scare. <laughs> 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 well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Rocksteady, Rocksteady hasn't really had a serious revival. So I think people associate Rocksteady, those who, those who even know what Rocksteady is, which is mm -hmm. not everybody, they think about the music as it existed in the 60s. Reggae got so popular that people associate reggae with Bob Marley and Peter Tosh <laughs> and some of the bigger names. But Ska, like, 
Jamaican ska wasn't particularly popular globally, you know, not in a, in a big way. And so people, the bigger names that people know are bands like Real Big Fish and Mighty Mighty Boss Tones and stuff, mm -hmm. which are fine bands, but, you know, it's not the full scope of ska. Mm -hmm. You know, there's old ska, there's very polit polit political ska, there's ska that comes from all different neighborhoods, different countries, different people that look all kinds of different ways. I mean, there's the sub the subcultures of ska have, have spread so far and wide. I actually think it's very interesting, yet people think it's actually like one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an odd thing that people have such a completely opposite view of the reality. Right. I want to take you to Southern California. In your book, you talk about sure. the famous shows at the Fenders Ballroom, Fenders in Long Beach in mm -hmm. the late 80s with a uh, um, Fishbone, Bad Manners, I believe. Why was this night in particular? I guess it was a night that you were in attendance uh, so important to oh, the I, evolution. I, I wasn't there because uh, I, I grew up here in Northern California. But I, oh, Northern. Mm -hmm. But I heard about it from at least a few people I interviewed brought it up. Um, mm -hmm. Greg, uh, Greg, the drummer of Hepcat, Hepcat. Mm -hmm. he brought it up. Uh, Chris Down from Fishbone, he brought it up too. Mm -hmm. I feel like someone else might have mentioned it, but yeah, Greg's point about that show was that he felt like it was a coming together of the scene in LA. That LA scene, that people, the the different mods, the skinheads, the rude boys, the punk rockers, all of those people were kind of in the room together, and he that he really felt like the scene was really spread out. But that when at that show, he kind of saw everybody, and mm -hmm. everybody was cool with each other everyone was down with each other and it really felt like a important moment from chris dowd's perspective from fishbone he really felt like he saw the seeds of 90s scott you know bad manners kind of didn't quite get their due the same level that the other two-tone bands did right. but they kind of stayed around longer than the other two-tone bands and he felt like they were a big influence on a lot of those bands because the sound was more energetic and maybe a little more circusy sounding and that that like they were around they were playing shows they were influencing the early bands fishbone obviously the sort of kinetic energy they had was a huge influence on the bands that came after them so he felt like that that show you had like bad manners and fishbone and then like all the all the a lot of the people that would go on to form bands mm -hmm. many of them were in attendance that night and it was a made a big impression on them Right. Also, uh, why was uh, in, now back to Berkeley, your area? Uh, why was International Ska Festival and Earth Day celebration in Berkeley, if I'm not mistaken, that was in 1990? Yeah. So it's significant. 1990, yeah. Nine, nine, yeah, 1990. Why was it? Why so did important. it happen? Mm -hmm. No, why was it so important? Um, as a reference point. It's a. It's a. Well, I feel like it's a. It's a really interesting reference point to think that the style of, of ska had been underrated most of the 80s you know you have bands like the untouchables you have bands like the uptones up here in northern california they're drawing they're drawing a lot of people you know people are coming out but there's still like labels don't really want to sign them mm -hmm. uh people are kind of saying ska's not doesn't really have the potential to be something bigger then you have the show at the Greek theater in Berkeley. And what, I, don't, I don't remember how many people, but it's like eight, 10,000 people come out. Nobody, I, you know, I wouldn't have even guessed at that time that that many people would come out to a ska festival. So I think it was, if anything, it just showed that there, mm -hmm. this music has a lot of fans, you know, mm -hmm. maybe more fans than, you know, the average person would expect. Even maybe people within the ska scene probably didn't mm -hmm. even realize that this amount of people are were actively interested in this style of music. So, and that was in 1990, um, which was, you know, years before any band got signed to a major label. But even after that show, nobody got signed. Amazing. You know? But it did, it, it was an indicator that like, hey, there, there's something here. Mm -hmm. And I think it kind of illustrates too how this, the genre just kept getting under, underrated and, and, you know, dismissed i think scott was dismissed a lot between two-tone and 
and uh, the third wave boom in, in like 95, 96. I mean, there was no reason why there had to be like 16, 17 years between when the first wave of American bands started forming and when the music got like a mainstream sort of level of of interest. I mean, that was a long period of time. Mm -hmm. You're no kidding. Music was very a lifetime, whole, as yeah. a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, bands it, just kept forming, audiences kept coming, mm -hmm. independent labels were forming, zines were forming, touring networks. I mean, it it was like a train. It was just chugging along and it was getting stronger and healthier. So, I mean, that says a lot, doesn't it? I, I like that analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about the first time uh, seeing Skank and Pickle and your friendship with uh, Mark Park. Sure. Uh, Skank and Pickle, I saw Sorry. them. I think his name Mike. Mike. Mike Park, yes. Yeah, Mike. Mm -hmm. I saw Skank and Pickle in 1992. I saw them in Northern California, up in uh, Santa Clara, California, in a, a place called One Step Beyond which was, uh, uh, it was a, it was just like a nightclub that had like shows, you know, all the kind of the underground touring bands played there. But Skank and Pickle were from this area. So they were technically a local band. What's the name of that venue again? It's called One Step Beyond. One Step Beyond. Uh, they got that name from Pittsburgh? <laughs> no, <Hey? laughs> that's the funny thing. It seems like a ska <laughs> reference, but it's not. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, these this was these were like rock clubs really i mean the, the the people that own that club they also own like the stone and the omni so i i don't know where they came up with one step beyond but it i there's no way that it was a reference to <laughs> prince buster or, or madness yeah, yeah. Uh, the skanga pickle were i i had no idea what ska was before i saw them i just was interested in underground music and, and music that was happening at the club level and a friend of mine knew that I liked entered like that this music, and he was like recommended I go check them out, and I was just totally blown away. I mean, they're such a fun band. Mm -hmm. That version of Skanga Pickle, that's an early version. That's when they were really crazy. That's when they were like their they had their original bass player Mike Mattingly. He was riding on his unicycle. There was like props. There was costumes. They were stage diving every five minutes <laughs> it was just like mayhem but it was like fun it wasn't violent you know you go to like a a punk show it's a lot of energy a lot of chaos but it's kind of got a scary edge to it this was not scary this was like a whole lot of fun very welcoming environment everyone was like you know, no one was exclusionary everyone was like you know like hey come on join us I, I felt like a good vibe there felt like there was a real interesting mix of people like i didn't feel like there was like a like a single look or a single kind of person it was different ages there was you know it felt like a it felt like a really comfortable place to be at you know i was a, right i was interested in these subcultures but i was also kind of a young kid who was you know maybe a little nervous by some of these subcultures too but I definitely not a skank pickle show. That just felt like a nice place to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started writing the band Fan Letters because I liked them so much. And I started to get into ska music too, you know. And uh, Mike started writing me back. And uh, oh. <laughs> we, we started becoming friends. He started inviting me to see, you know, come hang out with them at shows and, and hang out with them outside of shows. So yeah, with in mm -hmm. no time i was like becoming friends with mike in particular and then the rest of the band too and the rest is history <laughs> yeah, the rest is history, yeah. <laughs> that was your baptism <laughs> sure <laughs> and why was operation ivy important to the rise of punk infused care yeah, in your opinion operation ivy were an interesting band because punk and ska had been so two-tone bands were mixing punk with old ska they were mixing, uh, they were reviving original Jamaican uh, Scott, mm -hmm. Rocksteady mm -hmm. and skinhead reggae. And they were taking like British punk rock in the seventies and sort of making a new thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the, the first wave of bands in America were definitely wanting to sound and be two-tone esque, you know, the untouchables, they, they took other elements like Northern soul and stuff, but it was two-tone was their reference point for ska. Absolutely. So there was inherently elements of punk in it because it wasn't it wasn't traditional Jamaican ska. It mm -hmm. was this new version of ska. Um, Operation Ivy were punk rockers. They were their reference point was punk rock. But Tim Armstrong, Lint, he was he was a huge ska fan also. 
and uh, he loved two-tone records. He loved, there was a local band Uptones. He was a huge fan of them. So he really wanted to, you know, play ska, but also all those guys were listening to this like mid eighties, like East Bay punk rock. And that's just, that was the music that really was their reference point. So they were approaching ska as punk rockers. You know, the other members of the band, like the drummer, he told me that he didn't even know anything about ska, but Tim sat him down and said, listen to these records. He played him the specials and the selector and all that stuff and said, this is, this is how you play it, you know, but you know, Dave was a punk rocker, you know? So they were, it was punk. I feel like in a way it was like they were a punk band, but who played ska Mm -hmm. and they were, their fans were punk rockers. They didn't really play with ska bands. Um, so Scott and the other and the other ska bands, I, I and the fans, I think didn't really, you know, they didn't. They saw those guys. They didn't have horns. They didn't dress in suits. <laughs> they didn't really act like a ska band. So it's like it was just a different thing. And they didn't get super popular either. It wasn't. They broke up as they were releasing their first album, and then a couple of years goes by, mm-hmm. and that album <laughs> starts to get around and. All the punk rockers love it, but all the ska kids start getting into it. And the ska kids are like, this is awesome. And they start, like a ton of them start building ska around the Operation Ivy record. So it's sort of like this new reference point for ska. Mm-hmm. Like, right. Play ska like this, like, like a punk band. Punk can be your primary reference point for ska. So it's like another, another moment of another evolution of this strain of, of ska. So it had massive major influences on the way that the next generation of kids were playing ska. Well, some of them, I mean, you know, some of them continued on the strain of two tone. Some of them were looking backwards and playing more traditional type ska. You know, it was like a web of of different versions of ska were happening, but the Operation Ivy strain was a very prominent one. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting observation. Now, you, on, on the subject of band, talk about a few of the bands who played significant roles in helping shape the diverse yet important ska scene in the Midwest. Uh, one okay. example would be Heavy Manners, uh, Gangster Fun, a Suicide yeah. Machine, and plus more. Heavy Manners were um, the first Chicago ska band. They started in 1980. And they broke up in 1984. So they were in the very, very early, one of the first American ska bands, mm-hmm. period. Um, they, they were more, two-tone was definitely a major reference point to them, but they were also really into reggae too. So they were, some of them were reggae musicians first and foremost. So they really brought that reggae element. Mm-hmm. They were into um, two-tone, they were into sort of that late late 70s punk rock. They had an interesting sound to them. Um, They took Chicago by storm in those early days. They were huge in Chicago. I mean, they would pack out the biggest clubs and uh, they tried to get a record label, uh, a record deal, it didn't happen. And then they just, you know, they broke up in 1984. and there wasn't still wasn't much of a ska scene really you know they were kind of it you know for the most part there was a few other bands and then um so bands were forming in the midwest but i feel like gangster fun was the most important band of the midwest to form in the 80s because mm-hmm. they were they formed in the i want to say mid 80s in detroit and um they got they got huge in detroit almost immediately people fell in love with that band and then they started touring all all over the Midwest and they sort of became every every major Midwest town's hometown ska band. You know, they just adopted gangster fun. They just took, and so they were a band that like, I would say they were kind of like, kind of still musically more like two-tone, but it was a, it was kind of a crazy energy to them. And mm-hmm. their, their lyrics were kind of offbeat and they did a lot of like, covers and they they took all the popular rock and roll songs and they turned them into ska songs it was and they really tried to create a kind of a manic like show and i think that really rubbed off on how the midwest approached ska in the 90s you know they all 
they all worshipped at the altar of gangster fun. I mean, you had Mustard Plug, uh, Memory 330, Suicide Machines. These bands all form having been big fans of gangster fun and having seen multiple gangster fun shows, um, Blue Meanies. But the, I think that what's interesting about the Midwest is that every band sounded totally different. You know, they didn't really, there wasn't like a Midwest sound so much as like mm-hmm. every band was just like, really did their own thing. <clears throat> if you go, if you think about like what, what ska sounded like in New York in the eighties and early nineties, there was definitely a sound. There was definitely a jazz element to it. There was definitely a two-tone influence that was prominent. Um, in Southern California, there was definitely a lot of pop punk that came kind of in the Orange County scene. In, in Northern California, where I'm from, Operation Ivy was such an important component that that element definitely mm-hmm. influenced the bands of that scene. Um, Midwest, it was just all over the place. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of that was because the Midwest is so spread out and you'd have like one or two bands per city. So they just sort of formed in these little bubbles on all on their own in a way with Gangster Fun sort of being the, mm-hmm. the main like influence on a lot of them in their early years. Yeah, he has a fun name to a um, stage name, Suicide Machines. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember this? So they were originally called Jack Kevorkian and the Suicide Machines. Do you remember all the Jack Kevorkian stuff back then? Yes, man. <laughs> I was in New York. <laughs> yeah, he was a, a doctor that was trying to help uh, right. normalize uh, assisted suicide for people mm-hmm. who are terminally ill. So, so they, they took And to a great name. extent, he had my support. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it was very, very controversial back then. So that band, they, they mm-hmm. took that name, Jack of Working and the Suicide Machines, and then before they got signed, they decided just to shorten it to Suicide Machines. Suicide which Machines. I think, was, mm-hmm. I think it was a better sounding band name. Mm-hmm. How yeah. about Mustard Plug? That one, that band came to mind as well. Yeah, yeah, they were great. They're from um, Michigan. Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the city. Grand Don't Rapids. That's it. Grand Rapids, mm-hmm. Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, they were a fun band, uh, but you know, they also like, I would say interesting, they had a lot of interesting elements and sometimes they were more on the fun, silly side. Sometimes then they were on the more serious political side. They, they kind of had a, well, all the different gamut, you know, mm-hmm. um, and they, they, they were touring all the time in the nineties. They were on the road all the time. So a lot of people remember mustard plug because they were touring so much, even though they weren't, they weren't on the radio per se they were on the road constantly mm-hmm. yeah pushing pushing the music uh, yeah. let me take a quick moment to remind our viewing audience and listeners that uh today's guest is journalist uh, podcaster ska enthusiast and author of the book in defense of ska aaron carnes uh is presently living in not living in northern california the sacramento area yeah Right, and so it's good to have you on. Uh, and I, um, we're yeah. going to be talking about your book extensively. Yeah, yeah, man. It uh, took you seven years to write, right? Seven years. Yes. But like man. I said, the first five years, it was kind of, I was not prioritizing it. I was mm-hmm. just working on it when I had the t- time, and mostly it was just doing collecting interviews, researching, and I didn't really understand the book I was trying to write for most of that time. I was just mm-hmm. like. I want to write something about ska because I love this music and I don't feel like it hasn't been taken serious enough to really been given the time and, and, and to go into a lot of these stories and to to paint to explain the subculture for what it really is mm-hmm. and the sub by, by the subculture I mean well there's like a lot of different subcultures with ska right you know there's the subcult, how, how ska was in the 80s and how ska was in the early 90s and how ska was with the more heavy punk bands versus the two-tone influence bands versus the traditional bands. I mean, there was so many different subcultures. It's very nuanced, but, you know, there's very little information outside of the scene about any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. That's how I felt back in 2013, 2014, when I was just beginning to really feel like I wanted to do something about ska. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you have done. What are some of the more important pop culture moments for Skia from the 80s up to this point? Maybe this is a more hopeful question. What were some of the more mo- important moments from the 80s and stuff of Skia? Mm-hmm. Um, right. Yeah. Well, I feel like 
<coughs> I feel like the Untouchables are probably one of the most important band from the 80s. From right here in Southern California, traditionalists. Mm -hmm. They, not only were they an interesting band and they had an interesting mixture of, of ska and reggae and uh, Northern soul type music, Mm -hmm. But they were, um, they led like a mod revival in, in Los Angeles in the early, yes, early mid 80s. I mean, they had scooters lined up outside of yes, their venues man. for mm -hmm. miles. You know, <laughs> <laughs> People would have scooter rallies to their shows. And, you know, <clears throat> they were really, you know, there was a whole subculture wrapped around them or they were at the heart of that. It's mm -hmm. just an interesting period of time that doesn't get a lot of attention mm -hmm. and doesn't get like, you know, people don't really know much about it, but you know, back mm -hmm. in that time, if you were into alternative culture at all, even if you weren't like a ska fanatic, I'm sure you were aware of it because there was all these mod kids and all their scooters everywhere, you know, and, and so many people went to see these bands. So, and they were, they appeared in like a handful of low budget movies, which was, which was kind of funny and interesting. Like they were in the film Repo Man, which was a pretty mm -hmm. popular film. They they played like a scooter gang. Well, actually, technically, they were playing a band coming home from rehearsal. Although it's not entirely clear when you're watching it, but they told me that's what they were mm -hmm. cast as a band coming home from rehearsal. Who was um, their grandma was being harassed by the Repo Man, and they basically like you know beat him up, <laughs> <laughs> and they had to play like mean guys, but they're like such nice guys, you know. So it's pretty funny. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, so they, that's, that's really interesting. Their story is interesting too, because they ended up getting signed by Stiff Records, which is a UK label. And they got flown to the England. And yes. they stayed in England and Europe for like eight months, recording Wild Child, touring all in those areas and like charting in England with uh, Free Yourself. And um, really looking like they were going to, blow up over there and probably over mm -hmm. here but unfortunately from a number of factors that just didn't happen i mean mm -hmm. i mean some of those factors were that stiff was sort of coming undone it was like you know stiff records used to be a major player they got signed kind of at the tail end and then they weren't just they were just kind of you know they were just weren't what they were you know and then, right they got transferred or to MCA and MCA I don't think it was all that interested. Didn't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't know how to market mm -hmm. them. They weren't all that into them either. So mm -hmm. they didn't. They did. They did them. get some airplay here in Southern California. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, for yourself, um, uh, what's gone wrong? I think got some airplay too, right? And then, mm -hmm. uh, on on major station. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, they, the, for yourself's video got played on MTV a bunch. Um, mm -hmm. yes that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that but i don't know for some reason it just didn't like it just didn't quite jump that level and for some reason it didn't carry on that mm -hmm. that legacy of like alternative music that everyone knows about right you know i'm not sure why that is exactly mm -hmm. maybe because it's ska i don't know <laughs> yeah we we'll guess we'll never know uh Albums, compilations. What are some of the crucial compilation albums that are must-haves, must-own for uh, you know listeners and fans of this genre? In your opinion? Um, well, you know, like I was always like, I was really partial to the Asian Man's Misfits of Ska one and two. Mm -hmm. Those came out in the, the mid '90s, and I feel like that. That was like Mike, Mike Park from Asian Man Records put those out. And I feel like that was the first real statement about what people would call third wave ska, kind of punk ska, mm -hmm. overtly kind of saying like, this is um, not traditional ska, very much, you know, it's a Misfits of Ska. And they had all the, the first Misfits of Ska had all the early bands that would eventually get really popular. Um, Sublime, Blue Meanies, you know, Real Big Fish. Voodoo yes. Vocals, all those bands were on the Misfits of Ska one. Um, I also really like California Ska Quake that came around, out around the same time. That was all California bands, um, no doubt. Uh, Dancehall Crashers, Hepcat. That I think is a really good collection of like mm -hmm. 90s, early 90s California bands for sure. Right. Um, New York Hit, Hit and Run, I think it's called. I'm, I'm sorry, I might, I might be messing up the name. That was the first official 
American ska comp ever. And that was put out in the 80s by uh, like an early, early Moon Records release. Back when Moon Records was still sort of becoming a thing, mm -hmm. Rob Hingley put that together. He was trying to document the early uh, New York scene at that time. And uh, mm. <laughs> he put uh, you know all those bands on that compilation. That's definitely an important one for sure. American Scothic that Chuck Wren did. I think he had a couple. Um, right. That was the first, and that was the first significant collection of Midwest ska. That's definitely a really important uh, compilation. Mm -hmm. So how many is so far? You mentioned two or four. Um, I would be the content. <laughs> four or five, I think. <laughs> All right, five. And there was two. a million. There was a million of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Some of those I have to go collect myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're definitely worth adding to my collection. Mm. <clears throat> Why do you think that more traditional styles of ska are primarily found on the coasts? I think that, um, at least back then, I, I think that, uh, I think that there's like sort of, a, there is a cool element to really knowing the details of the history of the subculture and to be able to get the right clothes and to replicate the music in a certain way. So, I think that there's just something about coastal scenes that ha has that element where I don't think that it's as common or popular in the, the middle of the country, in the Midwest or the South. Mm -hmm. Things are just kind of what they are and a little less, little less hip, a little less like, you know, connected to the greater context. It's just like, this is what we do, you know. Perhaps like, the keyword like, here is hip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not to say people. Yeah. In it's, the it's, you know, you got bands that are like jazz, that have trained yeah. in jazz, that are wearing nice suits, that mm. are, you know, they could rattle off like detailed ska history. Yeah. They're definitely a little more hip than the kids who are just like, <clears throat> you know, mixing punk and ska and just dressing like whatever and wanting to go crazy. <laughs> so yeah interestingly enough <clears throat> so i've read excerpts from your book and you're critical of uh miss samal <laughs> my boy lollipop uh. which original uh, ska artist uh you know she's original uh ska artist who took yeah. the music worldwide and so i'm interested in in hearing your opinion as to why sure you're, i mean you're critical yeah. of her and that song in particular no uh I, I totally respect her. She's important and she's a good Oh, they are different issues. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Your respect for her, your love for her, and yeah, why she, you think that there was I just don't example. like that song. Uh -huh. So I, <clears throat> I was trying to have fun with, um, I was trying to have fun with really getting into the detailed history of how ska was pushed in the U.S. in, in, this, in this 1964 as a dance trend. Mm -hmm. And uh, attempted to be at least. I tried to have fun with telling that story by also sort of confessing that I didn't really care for My Boy Lollipop because mm -hmm. I felt like everyone I knew that was a ska fan always said that they loved that song, and I, I just, I just don't like that song. Mm -hmm. uh, right. No, but it no has, it, the song has its place in history, though. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, it's I an important history. So that we could have a, uh, some sort of conversation around the song. So in 1965, it sold in excess of uh, 5 million copies. Yeah, it has uh, an important, it, and, it has an important place in history. However, what I was trying to say, too, is that mm -hmm. there's another side to that history, and that history is that record labels, and so record labels saw the success it had and were like, all right, ska is going to be the next big thing and jamaica th their sort of um tourism board uh edward siega i think he was definitely a big component of that they saw ska as a at that time as a as a thing that had potential to you know bring tourism to the country so there was all these factors that i think that the fact that millie small was able to make a hit single out that was ska technically that everyone was like okay so there was all these like other other effects to her success. And that's what I was trying to talk about, that mm -hmm. there's a whole story about what happened as a result of her success. Not her fault, obviously. Right. I mean, because, you know, my understanding is that underground radio station in England really made Skia that particular song. Yeah. Lord become larger than life. 
Definitely. But the then it like became a what those um, Radio Carolina or those yeah. DJs just fell in love with it. And they were they were reluctant to play other songs. So I don't think it was necessarily re- labels that Grease Palm. I think people just love the song. It's sketchy. The offbeat is danceable. So yeah. I think it, in a sense, sold itself. You know, they, yeah, I agree. I think what happened was the labels in the, in the U.S. thought that other mm-hmm. songs would become really popular. And so they pushed all these other ska songs and all these like American bands to play mm-hmm. ska. And it did not work. It did mm-hmm. not sell well. Mm-hmm. It was just Millie. She was the only one that was able to make a hit single at that time uh, mm-hmm. out of ska. And right. so it's interesting to think about the um, the way the labels reacted to her success. Mm-hmm. They thought it was going to be this whole big dance craze, but yeah, it was not. Right, it didn't, right. it didn't, uh, okay. it didn't pan out that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was from an economic point of view, from their yeah. angle. Right. Yeah. But you know, the, the song really, again, she um, opened doors for uh, a lot of other musicians. Sure. At yeah. that time, there was the first song to internationalize the Jamaican music. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely it it made she Island Records. It made took Island it Records. To the four everything. corners of the world. Yeah. She performed in places like New Zealand. I took some notes like Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, Brazil. Uh, back then, most of the artists in Jamaica didn't even have passport as yet. <laughs> when even thinking about <laughs> going to England. So we're talking about 1964 now. So she um, uh, really took her place. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yes, man. Uh, yeah. Yes, she had several other hits, but didn't make it uh, as big as My Boy Lollipop. Also, I read somewhere where someone said that it gave acceptance, that song gave acceptance to the offbeat. Okay, it's okay now for musicians in any genre of music to make songs on the offbeat, which I don't okay, fully understand the concept. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, you know, it's okay to make a song on the offbeat because this song is not on the one, two, three, four, as Ernest Rangin was explaining it. It's on the yeah. two, four, right? So it's okay. We see the world dancing to it. Yeah. So those are some of the things that um, we have to, by default, if you say, give credit to uh, Millie Small and um, Ernest Ranglin, the musicians and their producer, I guess, Chris Blackwell, credit for. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, so pick it up. The second go around now, um, uh, for the internationalization of Jamaica music, I came, was the Harder Day Come. That was a few years later. Yeah. But Millie Small, was, uh... and a female at that was, quite a yeah. few steps ahead of those. For sure, actors. yeah. And then you had, in between those two, you had uh, Desmond Decker's Israelites. Yeah, Israelites, yeah. that one so big, especially in the United States and Europe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I just want to give proper respect to Millie. You know, she died recently. Yeah. Uh, much to our sorrow. Mm-hmm. So that was basically uh, my contention with your point. <laughs> You know, it's a, a fair point. I mean, it's a dumb opinion, but I just wanted to oh, tell. Oh no, that no, history. man! Everyone is. Up, as, I, I, I just what, what I showed, what I, what, what I put on display was some facts. That if my opinion is hard sure. to conclude whether that I love or hate the song, I just brought out some facts that she really opened doors. Oh, definitely. For a lot of people, yeah. and also for the offbeat, which is also important. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you're entitled to your opinion. A lot of mm-hmm. people don't. You know, I play that song at an event one time and they didn't hire me again. <laughs> what I, was <laughs> I, I don't think it was just that stuck. It was just, uh, it was uh, a, a, a club and you know, everybody had 45s, I had albums. <laughs> and I was just playing top 10, which I'm used to in Jamaica, my boy, Lollipop, Prince Buster, 30 Pieces of Silver, uh, Alton Ellis, you know, those are the songs that I grew up listening to. So I thought, well, that's what you play. Then I discovered now you play songs uh, of for that for the elitist now you play 45s and more obscure. And uh-huh. I gave away all my obscure <laughs> records. Now they value thousands of dollars. But that was that experience <laughs> playing Millie Small. But I'm gonna make it my point of duty to play it more just to annoy people <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. So as we move, sir, uh, what role do you think uh, Voodoo Glow Scouts play in helping popularize Latin ska in the United States? Um, I think that, um, I mean, I think people seeing, I think that when they were coming up in the in the mid-90s was when they really started to get popular. I mean, they've mm-hmm. been around since the late 80s, but 
I think that, you know, people's young Latino kids saw them. I think there was definitely an effect on seeing them on stage and stuff. But then the fact that they wove Spanish into their music, I think was probably a huge mm-hmm. thing. They yes, took their mm-hmm. second album. They always had a little bit of Spanish in their songs, but their second album, they recorded all in Spanish. And um, <clears throat> I don't think you really saw Spanish in like popular alternative music in the US at that point. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't really think of much. Um, like Oso Motley came out like in the late 90s and they started to make that a thing. And then you started Good to Freddie Friend to be considered. But but Voodoo Gostos did it like 96. Uh-huh. Yeah, so they were doing it before Oso Motley made it a like, popular thing. Being, you know, having all this Spanish and like not, you know, not typical like quote unquote like Spanish market. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, like the sort of the alternative market. You know, Oso Motley were a really cool band um, that had a lot of fans that probably didn't typically listen to Spanish music. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you started to see a growth of alternative Spanish music in LA of, you know, really, it's really grown in the last 10 to 15 years. You're not kidding, boy. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's, it's inter- and it's all this interesting, kind, you know, interesting eclectic music. Mm-hmm. Udo Gloskos were like a punk rock ska band. Right. And they were, um, they were, they were not playing to the quote unquote Spanish market. They were playing to just the, just the same market as all the other ska bands, all the other mm-hmm. punk bands were. And uh, they were, they were singing in Spanish and they were Latino members in that band. So I think it was pretty huge. I talked to some of the, some of the people from that sort of East LA scene and they would talk about Voodoo Glow Schools being a major influence when they were kids, you know, mm-hmm. the scene that really kind of grew in the two thousands. So, yeah, right. I don't think Voodoo Glow Schools were even realized it at the time. I don't think they <laughs> Of course not. It. Yeah. These things are not realized at the time, you know, yeah. <laughs> almost I was in retrospect. <laughs> So uh, a landscape that I'm terribly fascinated with Mexico. Let's talk about the popularity of Ska in Mexico or sure. Mexica as it is known. Mexica, when yeah. did you visit Ska, uh, Mexico and what were some of your observation in general? I went to Mexico in 2019 and uh, mm-hmm. I went to okay. Oaxaca specifically because there was a festival called Scatlon that happened there in like the spring of 2019. And it was it was considered a smaller festival because Oaxaca's not Mexico City. Mexico City is sort of the epicenter, but there wasn't one happening in Mexico City when I was in that time when I was able to go. Mm-hmm. But it was like eight to ten thousand people there, which is <laughs> amazing. Not, that not, that's not a major. Small. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Mexico, the audience was pretty young, which is interesting. That kind of lets mm-hmm. you know that it's an active, vibrant scene, not one where the audience has grown. So it's showing you that there's new uh, new fans growing into it. And um, the bands, the bands were largely influenced by American 90s ska punk mm-hmm. with some exception. American like ska punk, like Less Than Jake and um, Suicide Machines, you know, Mustard Plug. This was like a lot of the influence to, to a lot of these bands. I mean, a lot of these bands formed in the mid nineties after hearing like American third wave ska as that, that was a lot of their reference point to ska mm-hmm. music, which was, I, I thought that was very interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the bands like Inspector, the very, very much influenced by two tone, um, but they're the exception. You know, I saw a few bands in Mexico that were, wore suits but very few did. <laughs> mm-hmm. they dress they dress like punk rockers absolutely right yeah and I, I've, I, I've having been down there quite a few times mexico city specifically yeah i guess the crowd that i'm familiar with and have with uh really traditionalists mm-hmm. they, they just love the traditional the ken booth the dead royal Wilson. yeah uh they the, go in droves to see uh stranger call Derek Morgan, those guys can perform there practically every year and have a huge turnout. Yeah, I mm. definitely think at this point, the audience has really grown to embrace all sort mm-hmm. of styles and subgenres of ska, but there's mm-hmm. a huge, huge punk rock ska. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And that's where a lot of the well, that's where a lot of the mech ska bands formed out of was that right i have yeah. i haven't been exposed to that mm-hmm. yeah. since i i've always gone with a traditionalist 
mm-hmm. the with the exception of Inspector, Inspector are a really really big band. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, very two tone, very two tone influenced, but mm-hmm. but also you know you can hear the Mexican rock music elements too to their um to as an influence, but. Mm-hmm. All the other big, big, big Mexican Mexica bands were very punk rock oriented. I right, know. the bigger ones, yeah. the smaller yeah. ones are smaller not ones. even too many traditional ska bands. Yeah, not too many, very few. But like, yeah, the 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 band leader for Inspector Jesus, he's like a, he's a skinhead. You know, he's got the 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 whole skinhead look and everything. But mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> tell our listeners about uh, tell listeners and viewers about the SCATU network and how important it might be for helping to keep the SCAT flame going until eternity. If sure, sure. Thing. SCATU mm-hmm. network is uh, Jeremy Hunter, Jeremy. Uh, mm-hmm. who's from uh, who's from Florida, and mm-hmm. uh, I think they're only mid twenties, so they're pretty okay. young. Yeah, Very young, right. Um, Scott Two Network was something they started doing for fun. They would take uh, um, non ska songs and just uh, cover them, and turn them into a ska song. And they would they made a YouTube channel and they would play all the instruments themselves, record it, and then cut it together. So you'd see them, you know, play trumpet, and then you then you see them play bass, then you'd see them singing. So it's really you know all in the same room, just cut back and forth but like they're really good at all the instruments mm-hmm. and i think it caught on because people would hear a song that they knew and loved and they would hear jeremy's version and jeremy's so enthusiastic and does it so well and so they would start sharing them and going viral and so many of their videos went viral and uh so i think it it kind of brought a little more energy into a younger generation the you know the young generation last five years or so in the right. sky. Yeah. And Inter- um, yeah, so I think- Interestingly, Germany- uh, it seems as though that's becoming a trend now where you take a song and just turn it into ska. Because I was out this past week uh, in LA and saw a couple of bands just did that. So yeah. you know this one, but we're going to do it in skinhead reggae. And I did Jackie <laughs> Mendez as a song and I did a song. Yeah, we're going to do it in ska style. I say, yeah, that's the thing. And it, you know, that it works and fits perfectly fine. It's 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 a tradition that dates back to the early days of ska of covering songs, right, English right, music. right. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's interesting how, you know, like Scott Tune Network, the, the tradition just continues to carry on, just mm-hmm. covering songs, turning them into ska, and it works. And it's mm-hmm. yeah, it's a legacy. Yeah, in a sense, I kind of lost track of time. I just want to remind um, listeners that um, in conversation with Aaron. Carnes. Today's guest is a musician, a journalist. I'm counting because you wear so many hats, a podcaster, ska enthusiast, and author of the book In Defense of Ska. Let me, let's plug this one more time. So. <laughs> Hometown Sacramento. Yes. Uh, the capital of California. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful conversation, at least from my vintage point so far. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. For me too, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, are we in the middle of a fourth uh, revival? Is there such a thing, sir? Skia wave revival? I think that, uh, I don't know if it's a fourth wave, but I think there is a growing interest of ska happening. So what would, what would you call it if it's not fourth? Uh, a continuation I mean, of... It's tricky because like <laughs> um, ska has... Ska didn't go away. There's been a, a pretty strong ska scene in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. So the new interest of ska that's happening i think there's more interest than there were it was five years ago but there also was a healthy i don't know it's kind of i i have a hard time explaining because i feel like it's a little contradictive but there was a healthy underground scene and there was like a lot of energy in in, in these different pockets with ska like mm-hmm. in la the east la latino ska scene was extremely vibrant five, six years ago when supposedly ska wasn't that popular. So that scene was just chugging along just just fine. I think the traditional ska stuff has been doing really well for the last 20 years. Uh, Chuck Wren has been putting out records. Uh, a lot of the bands on, on his label, I mean, they've, they've had a healthy scene the last couple decades. Um, mm-hmm. 
but you see bands that are maybe more punk oriented or maybe a little bit doing more different stuff like you maybe that kind of went away or maybe it wasn't as popular and now that's becoming more popular and then mainstream is taking a little more interest in it the last year i mean you're starting to see you know you had um jeff rosenstock who's who used to be a ska musician but he kind of became a really popular indie rock musician mm. um he put out a ska record a few months ago that got a lot of attention outside of ska the band we are the union who have been around for probably 12 years originally from midwest i think but now they're all over now i think the 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 main singer lives in la now and um the record that they put out a month ago got a ton of attention as well so there is some interesting... in what category traditional punk oh it's more oh, wow. more punk you know punk. oriented yeah these are more yeah yeah more like punk. i guess you know if you mm -hmm. were to take a broad category more like punk ska so but i haven't seen this much attention paid to ska in the mainstream since the 90s mm, interesting with the, the attention that jeff got the, mm -hmm. the attention that we are unions getting and some of the general some of these new bands cat bite from philadelphia bad operation from new orleans uh scott Toon network gets a lot of attention jeremy hunter uh they they get they have a lot of followers on twitter and wow. a lot of subscribers on youtube um these bands are getting a lot of attention, but there's a lot of other bands too that are not getting mm. a lot of attention that have been around a while. So, mm. so what are some of your favorite bands in, on the subject of bands? Uh, current bands? Or yeah, current, contemporary. Well, I yeah, really maybe like maybe really contemporary. Like uh, current, yeah. If if we generalize it, then you're gonna go back to maybe 30 years. So maybe yeah, keep it to no, present. I, I actually really like these bands, like Cat Bite and, and Bad Operation and, and the new Where the Union album, the Jeff Jeff Rosenstock. I, I think all I think they're all really great. They're really interesting. The influences are pretty unique. Catbite are kind of like a rock and roll garage rock band that plays sort of mid-tempo ska, uh, a little some, some some soul elements, power pop. Um, I, I mean, it's not. I wouldn't technically call it a punk ska band. It's more like a rock and roll soul band that plays ska. Bad Operation does like. I feel like it's kind of a gritty version of two tone. It's unique. Mm -hmm um the the weird the union album is kind of like almost like synth uh, anthem rock with ska and it's it's different than what they were doing before it's very very interesting jeff rosenstock's album is like kind of crazy a little bit it's all over the place because he he took his last album that he released last year called no dream and he just turned it into a ska album he just re-recorded it and um the whole entire album whole entire album uh -huh. made it a ska album but it's not like straight up ska it's like right it's like ska metal punk uh reggae it's like all over the place it's just changing every second it's kind of a, <laughs> a man if you had asked my opinion i would tell him put out two albums put out that album as it was in uh, in the previous format and then yeah. you re-record yeah uh, well as we did he, he released it last year then he just released the ska album this year oh so he released both yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's clever. Nothing went to Yeah, worse. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, yes, that stuff's sir. all super interesting to me, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And then, uh, you know, band, there, I think some of the bands in other countries are doing really interesting stuff still, like um, uh, Tokyo Ska, Paradise Orchestra. They're still putting out amazing records. Mm -hmm. um, what's the you, Have you paid any attention to some of the newer bands here in South, from Southern California? Uh, yeah, like ma ma um, a lot of the like uh, a lot of the stuff happening in Southern California is in like the is still like mostly in the Latino scene, mm -hmm. and uh, there's lots of lots of great stuff happening. I really love Delirians. I mean, they're not super new, but them and Study Forty Fives, they're more like mm -hmm. the traditional traditional but kind of soulful style of ska. Mm -hmm. Definitely has like some of the like yeah, it's gonna be hard to get any more traditional than a Study Forty Five and uh, Delirians. Yeah, the delirium. Yeah, the delirium is kind of. And I like what I like about the delirium. Delirium is kind of moving away from traditional. Now. I think. Yeah. They're 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 going through rebirth. I think they're more going yeah. reggae now. Tro yeah, I agree. They're more reggae now, but I like their ska stuff because I feel like they took some of that Latino like oldies sound too, and they mm -hmm. mixed that with traditional ska. Right. It's really interesting. Really interesting mix. I think really yeah. good stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right. Well, um, your book, again, um, I'm shamelessly promoting it. <laughs> and you, you, <laughs> I hope you paid Eric on the table for it. What would you hope readers will take away from your book, sir? I think the main thing I want people to take away is that um, I think s- the main thing is that Ska, Ska is a very diverse um, style of music. Uh, it's it's had a lot of energy f- ever since it's ever since it started in Jamaica and was revived in England. It has been all over the place. It's been all over the world. And it has it's it's been in all different forms of music you know mixed with metal mixed with soul music everything everything Everything. Mm -hmm. like i would want people to really understand the vastness the diversity Mm -hmm. that you see you see bands form in like rich suburbs you see bands form in in poor ghetto neighborhoods it really gets embraced by whoever loves it in the form you know it really i think more than any style of music really it like takes the shape of you know where it's at you know it, it people own the music and they they really put themselves into it and it becomes whatever they do becomes their thing and ska mm-hmm. is like a really interesting ingredient mm-hmm. and so and i think the subculture is really fascinating i i just i think people should pay more attention to, to ska the music and the subculture and mm-hmm. you know be not so quick to just write it off or dismiss it or just crack some jokes about it and really you know take it in mm-hmm. Yes, you, know, sir, you, and, uh, you don't have I to think, love the music. And it's just, you know, yes. mm-hmm. just try to understand. It, it really and truly produced some of, you know, it, it came out at the time of Jamaica's uh, about to attain independence and some mm-hmm. really great musicians came out at the time, you know. Leading the pack was Dan Drummond, who was considered yeah. one of the greatest uh, trombone player in the entire world. We're not just talking about Jamaica, the yeah. entire world. Uh, so it's, yeah, it, it's serious. You know, as a matter of fact, it wasn't, it's, I wasn't taken seriously by a lot of Jamaican musicians because I remember, and I yeah. can state this, state this emphatically, that when Tommy McCook came back from the Bahamas and Cox and Dad urged him to form a band, you know, he wasn't interested. But then he played, uh, he heard a song by Dan Drummond, School in the Duke, and he said, who is this guy? He says, from right here in Jamaica, and he's interested in forming the band. Tommy says, sign me up <laughs> when he heard Dan Drummond playing the trombone. That was way beyond expectation and belief. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Tommy is well, well accomplished. Uh, Roland, those are top of the line musicians <laughs> that you know play just as well as and, uh, any other musician from any other culture. So yeah, that, I, I really and truly I love and appreciate the book and your effort. Oh, thank you, thank you very years. much. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was uh, like, I, 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 I hear what you're saying about even how Ska is perceived in Jamaica because I remember I was watching, um, there was a Bob Marley documentary. I think it was the the, the one that was produced, like the really, really well produced one. Um, and there was a- What well, is some badly produced one? I don't, the, I don't think I've it was seen like a really, uh, It was like a big budget one. It was a big budget doc, oh, okay. Bob Marley one. Yeah. And um, there was an interview with uh, Lee Perry. And he was basically talking about when he started working with Bob Marley, that's sort of the beginning of Roots Reggae, like in the early seventies, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, he made a quick comment about how like, oh yeah, ska music, that's um, that's dance music. And he kind of like says, you know, like the reggae, that's, you know, that's serious music. Like kind of, I, I don't know how he phrased it, but it, that was mm-hmm. the gist of what he was saying. Almost like, yeah, ska music, that's You that's mean fine. Lee Perry or Bob? Lee Perry said this, this was like- Well, a, Bob said the same thing. Why you want to go back to the past? Yeah. Ska is in the past. Mm. So it's kind of like, yeah, Scott's yeah, they all, dancing, it's been written but, off know, by all of those people. Reggae mm-hmm. is the, that's the real, mm-hmm. that's the, that's the, the real music, you know. Mm-hmm. But interestingly enough, when those same musicians, uh, well, those, those musicians are there, but a lot of musicians from the Scott era, when they come to Los Angeles and they have their lens focused on LA, they really started incorporating Scott into their playlist after they realized that it's a oh, huge yeah. following out here. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Cliff, Makes Toots, sense. Bonnie Whaler. I said, wow, this is the scare. <laughs> this is this is you know destination for a scare. Yeah, so yeah. they started incorporating it. <laughs> you see, the, the audience, you know, they they speak volume. <laughs> they, <laughs> they speak volume. Mm-hmm. And we have a huge scare fan base out here in California. 
Yeah, they love the traditional. I mean, of course, they love other genres, but yeah, Ska has its home here in LA, probably the most popular place in the United States. My last question, though, uh, and I'd be remiss not to talk about your podcast and, you know, publicize it. Sure. What led you to, uh, you know, start doing a podcast and how and where can people hear or find, locate your podcast? I started the podcast with my friend Adam Davis um, in January this year as a means to promote my book, which mm-hmm. is why it's called In Defense of Ska also. Um, once we got maybe five, six episodes in and we started to really feel a, a, a good, strong rhythm, mm-hmm. I think we started to see how it had its own value separate from my book as well. So we've been really growing it and we've been really putting a lot of energy into it and we're continuing on you know my books my book was released back in may but we're still we're still doing the podcast we're still mm-hmm. you know we're still we have a vision for it to continue on you right. know, indefinitely so i think like what we're doing the long form format except it's me and my co-host adam we, we have a so it's like a both of us would talk to guests and um I don't know. I think that we we found a good rhythm to have good long form conversations, and we're we're getting we're getting some good guests. You know, we're getting people from the ska scene. We're getting people outside of the ska scene who mm-hmm. have some sort of connection to ska. Like, I mean, the biggest guest we ever had was uh, Patrick Stump from Fallout Boy, who was, um, I mean, that's a band who plays arenas. They're known for kind of playing emo emo rock music and. Uh, we found out that the singer of that band was a huge ska fan, mm-hmm. and um, we had a friend. We had a we had a friend who was friends with him, and we asked him, "Would he like to be on the podcast?" And he's like, "Yeah, he would love to talk about ska." Mm-hmm. Would never <laughs> ask him about ska, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, we talked about ska for like an hour and fifteen minutes. And yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> well, Aaron, um, thanks. Um, and where can people get your book to buy? Um, you know, you can get it on Amazon. You can uh, go to clashbooks.com to order mm-hmm. directly from my publisher. You you can go to your local indie store or library. And if they don't have it, you can just request it and they will order it. Um, no problem. You know, the, the, mm-hmm. it helps. Are you pleased with the sales so far? Sale, you, want, you want to know what the sales are so far? Um, um, if it's not good, don't tell me. That's fine. We sold a, a little over 5,000, which is really well, good. Well, that's good, man. Yes, man. Yeah. Yes. Congratulations. Gang they gang. say, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So uh, any, any, besides you promoting it, is the um, publishing house behind it? It's, um, they support me, but it's been me. I've been pushing. You. Uh-huh. I've been pushing it since last September. So mm-hmm. I've been harassing every uh, major media outlet. <laughs> yes. And uh, some of them have come through. Yeah, I got mm-hmm. it in Rolling Stone. I got in uh washington post yes, Esquire, <laughs> uh, stereo gum so yeah you know, yes sir ab cool. club so nice nice yeah. nice well you know we have some uh fun questions so at this point oh, let okay. me welcome our producer eric Kohler, who was um most uh you know fundamentally started this it was his brainchild that we should put this together so good friend <laughs> okay. and producer eric Kohler. How's it going, Aaron? You guys are I, I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, listening to the uh, in the wings here. Um, it's really great to have your your perspective as, as a not only a fan but also just such a um, uh, writer who knows a lot of, and, and is very enthusiastic <clears throat> and passionate about about the music. So thank you for um, thank you for joining us today, Junior. I've I've, uh, I've enjoyed uh, listening as well, and um, just a few questions here, two of which are very similar, but but. Um, in, in reading your book, you do an amazing job at, at touching on them. So if you can, um, who, in your opinion, are, who was the most surprising artist to have dabbled in ska in their younger years? The most surprising mm-hmm. in, 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 through your research uh, for the book? Um, well, I, I just mentioned Patrick Stump. Okay. Uh, yep. I, did not, I did not know about this while I was writing my book. Um, so it's not in my book, but I found out about it because of the fact that I, I wrote the book and started the podcast and we got that lead. Our lead, oddly enough, was um, Brian Diaz from Edna's Goldfish. Oh, wow. Okay. So he works as, he's been working as a guitar tech the last 15 years or 
20 years and he's been working for fallout boy a lot of that time <clears throat> and so we interviewed him on the podcast and he made a comment about how um patrick likes to uh sound check sometimes with the animal chin songs and i was like animal chin that's, that's such an obscure band <laughs> for like a band you know it's not like he said um real big fish you know animal right chin. So right that, an obscure midwest band and we're like wow it's so interesting so that's what got us to think like wow would he want to be on the show and so he told us that basically ska was his music that's what he was that's what he listened to that's what he played he was a drummer he wanted to be a ska drummer in mm -hmm. his early years wow. uh, like his early versions of bands were trying to play ska with him on drums um but then he ended up you know joining fallout boy and as the guitar singer or whatever the singer and that's the direction they went in you know mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. animal chin oddly enough kind of was sort of his bridge of like rock and roll kind of you know the, the influences they brought and you could really hear um the way that jamie of animal chin sings you can really see that as a major influence on patrick wow. uh, with the way he sings for fallout boy and for the for the interview when we set it up he was like, he's like, hey, uh, oh, I, I made this, uh, I made this recording of a sellout by I believe a fish, real big fish last year, just as a, as a, it's like a test, a studio test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He has a home studio. He's and he sent it to us. He recorded all the instruments, and uh, the the trombone was the main thing he was trying to test because he was, you know, trying to. So he the, the trombone really sticks out, but it, other than the, the the slide trombone, right, like it sounds almost exactly like the original uh, Real Big Fish version of it, even the singing. He sent us this, yeah, and we're just like, wow, that's so <laughs> He recorded this like a year ago, not for us. He did it for yeah. his own, yeah. Wow, wow. So yeah, that surprised me to find okay, out that he was sure. a massive Scott fan. Yeah, I'll have to go back and listen to that that podcast episode. I, I just finished um, your interview with uh, um, Chuck from, from Untouchables. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a really good one. Oh, thank you. Um, and then I think uh, you had the Voodoo Gold Schools, right? No, we didn't. No, have no, you didn't have. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but anyways, congratulations. We did Clemente uh, Ruiz, who was like sort of the, the LA, the, he books like all right. the shows in the, in the mm -hmm. Latino scene last, you know, 15 years. Yes. Yes. Um, that was a really good interview um, because, you know, he's a, he's in a really important figure that like, you know, people, you know, he's, he's a behind the scenes person, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. Everyone that's in the scene, like, knows he's the guy, right? Right, and right. Outside of it has no idea who he is. Yeah. 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 Interesting. The unfairness of life. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. And, and we try to definitely celebrate those behind the scenes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple other questions. So the, um, the when MTV did the Saturday, uh, yeah. Carson Daly, Obviously, it's been it's been criticized. Some people obviously really loved it because of, you know, at least showcase ska. But if if you could have done it, meaning I meaning if you could have curated it, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but we can have fun with this. How how would you have done it differently? Well, I want to say this about Scott Day, the the song selection wasn't bad. Okay, yeah. like the songs they played. Like they had, they had two tone songs. Yeah, it was had, it was a good cross section, right? Of, of they the, had of the Fishbone, music. they had the new stuff. I mean, some of that was just the fact that there wasn't a lot of ska videos. So, <laughs> right. you know, I think the the part that's a little feels it's the in between stuff. The, the contrived, yeah, really, yeah. Like they really just goofified it quite a bit, and they really just tried to. They really, I think, tried to make it seem like it was a single subculture that they were, you know, like, this is the subculture, you know? And I feel like that's where, that's sort of the beginning of the like problem that happened mm -hmm. when Scott went mainstream is like a misunderstanding of the multitude of subcultures that created ska by the mid nineties and having it like kind of presented as like, this is what it is. I mean, how would I curate it? I don't know. Like, it's hard to explain. Yeah. Ska I mean, I had to write an entire book. I don't even know <laughs> if I fully covered it because it, it isn't a single thing. That's part of my point. Correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think I, that, yeah. you did a good job of, of doing that too. So 
I think that I would try to maybe have not made it funny or silly. And, you know, I definitely wouldn't have casted Carson Daly, no, no, no shine on him. <laughs> but uh, right, right. I, I think all yeah. the, the goofy kids dancing, I don't know. That, that was just, I don't think that was the best choice. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And I don't even know how long it, how many weeks it aired. For. Oh, it was a single two hour oh, okay. special. Okay. All right. That, yeah. That's why I could only find <laughs> footage from one show. Okay. Got that it. was not uh, available when I wrote the book. Um, it's got online like. Yeah. Over the last year is yeah. when I've seen it. Yeah. But I knew about it. There was information online. Yeah. And so I was like, I was just like going, I was trying to, I was messaging people. Eventually I found somebody who taped, like basically they played their copy on their TV and they videotaped wow. just the in-between <laughs> segments. <laughs> and then they, they sent it to me in a Dropbox and I was wow. able to watch them. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. Now it's like, you just get on YouTube. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause when I, I mean, I watched a lot of MTV back then and I don't, I don't remember it. I don't remember. Um, so maybe they didn't do a good job of promoting it back then. <laughs> it was 1997. I didn't re I didn't watch it at that time too, because I was not a fan of the MTVization of ska when yeah. it happened. I was like, you know, I was young and, you know, I, that was my music and I didn't like the fact that it was like on the radio and on MTV and, you know, I was not, I was not into it at all. I mean, I can look back now and see like that it wasn't, it's not a black and white thing. Yeah. It's a, there's a, there's, there's pros and cons of to it and sure, sure. Good and bad versions of it. So, but at the time it was like, that's bad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, the other question is, just in general, what was the biggest surprise um, that you experienced in, in writing and, and doing research and, and interviews for your book? Um, I would say we talked about this already, but I think learning the extent to which Mexico is fully embraced ska is pretty surprising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, 25,000 people coming to festivals every year in Mexico City. I mean, that's pretty mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, every, you know, Scottalite, Selector, all the main bands uh, and on the nineties bands, the Mexican bands themselves. I mean, that's the destination. That's the, sure. that's the best show they're going to play yeah. <laughs> right now is if they get like Pepsi ska festival or the non Pepsi. or the non -ska, non stop ska fest, right? I this think is nonstop one. is over. Okay. Pepsi's still going. Got it. Or it could be the other way around. I, I think it's Pepsi that's still going. But yeah. who knows with the pandemic? Before pandemic, one nonstop, I think, had already been over. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, still. But they were both, you know, they were both that same size. Um, so learning about that and learning too that it was like it was what an interesting history because they kind of had a mainstream, they kind of went from DIY in the 90s to mainstream in the early 2000s with bands getting major label deals, getting on the radio. And it kind of went, and then it kind of, you know, mm -hmm. then it kind of became not popular like it did here, but then it like stayed really popular in the underground and it peaked back up wow, okay. um, because of the bands working so hard and sort of like they really went the festival route the last you know decade or so yeah. they really pushed these big festivals and that's what really has that's why why it so continues to be so popular yeah, yeah. true and that, and i think that the fact that the culture didn't mock it the way it, it did here right i don't think it ever was seen as like it, well because it was never seen as like oh that's a bunch of dorks <laughs> it was seen right. as that's what kids from the disenfranchised like neighborhoods with like right. who have things to say about their government that's the kind of music they listen to <laughs> true true yeah interesting yeah that's fascinating <laughs> um well is there anything that that we did not touch on uh during this uh this interview and conversation that you'd like to talk about or share or promote i think i think we covered it you know yeah the podcast uh you go to aaroncarns.substack.com. That's where I'm hosting it, but you can find it wherever you um, podcast. <laughs> podcast. Yeah, it's 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 on all the major platforms. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, I'm gonna since Junior did an amazing job of, of, of showcasing <laughs> this. Always a competition now. Uh, you gotta uh, hold this up for ten times uh, <laughs> to catch me up. Uh, no, no, hold it a little bit so people can see right. exactly what it is. Uh, there you go.
Uh, really, really have enjoyed. Um, uh, this was a great read, fun read. Um, and obviously really appreciate you being a, mm -hmm. a guest here, um, Aaron, and, and congratulations again. And Thank all you. the best and, and continuing to uh, Mm -hmm. push the book and and uh junior yes, thank sir. you as always as well yeah i want to thank you thank for you. uh taking i i, I can't say yeah you know our music so and i really thank you on behalf of the founding fathers of this great music you know for taking such a firm stand oh, and thanks, taking yeah. seven years out of your life to yeah. write this book <laughs> yeah thanks again, Aaron. so i just want to remind the viewers i think we've just about reached our destination uh i guess has been Aaron Carnes who is a musician, journalist, podcaster, Ska enthusiast, and of course, in defense of Ska. Yeah, is, is this your first book, your debut book? Yeah. Uh, what a way to make your debut. So what a spectacular <laughs> debut. Thanks, Liz. Thanks again. Thanks again, Aaron. Right, again, it's so A-A-R-O-N-C-A-R-N-E-S. -A -A yes, and go check out his book. It's definitely well worth your time. And uh, I really and truly take pride in holding this book up because I want people to know more about this great music so that they too can join us in honoring the ancestors of this great music. Yeah, I feel like I just want to mm -hmm. add, like, even though my book primarily focuses on the post two-tone era ska, because I think that's that's the stuff that people make fun of the most. Like, I don't think people make fun of old, you know, traditional Jamaican ska, but at the same time, I don't feel like people honor it the way it should be honored. Like, it should be, mm -hmm. you know, the way we honor jazz in mm -hmm. this country, the way we honor some of these great players, I don't feel like- Is it uh, because it's foreign music? It could be because it it's foreign. It could be here. because it's, you know, it's ska music because it, it's seen as simple music. It's just- a Alien music, you know? from somewhere else. But, you know, why, why aren't these horns, like Don Drummond, we talked about him, why isn't he up there with some of these, um, you know, like some of these jazz greats? Yeah, he should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like they they should be they should these these people should be like honored as like you know these fantastic musicians mm -hmm. and fantastic music so yeah I don't know that's not that wasn't my that wasn't the focus of my book but I feel that's mm -hmm. an important aspect too about like a people reconsidering the legacy of ska is like mm -hmm. that it wasn't ska wasn't just the predecessor of reggae it was this own brilliant moment of music in Jamaica. A proud moment too. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's proud true. Moment. Yeah, yeah no, and, and proud musicians that came out of that era. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and 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 we really, you know, we should celebrate and really need writers like yourself. We we were um, fortunate to have Heather Augustin on at some point last year, and we'll have um, in one of our upcoming uh, episodes mm -hmm. uh, Mark uh, Wasserman. So, um, uh, you know, you you authors and, and you who really dig deep, <laughs> it's it's amazing. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, keep keep it up. Yes, once again, Aaron. Yeah, man. Thanks very much. Um, and I want to encourage our viewers and listeners to please follow us at History of Eleskia Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our Facebook group. I can't say this enough. Join our Facebook group. This series is produced by my good friend here, Eric Kohler, for Rockery Radio. Please follow at Rockery Radio, under, Rockery underscore radio. That's Rockery underscore radio on Instagram for fresh rock rhythm and soul and Jamaican music inspired daily Spotify playlist. Yeah, man, work harder than a <laughs> firefly every day, new playlist along with Sean, right? Yes. Wow, sir. man, talking about profound discipline. Thanks again to everyone and thanks again, Aaron. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Aaron. Thank you, Junior. Yeah. Have a great one. Take care. All right. All right.